Okay, we're going to call this Transportation Committee hearing to order. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Monday, March 18th, 2024, Senate Committee he hearing of the Transportation Committee. The time is 3.05, and we are in room 1100 of the Minnesota Senate Building. A quorum is present. Uh, and with that, uh, Senator Bolden is going to take over the gavel while I present the first bill. Just very quickly, members, we have eight bills on the table, most with the exception of uh, item number five, we will lay over for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. All right. Senator Dipple with Senate File 4067. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to present Senate File 4067, which makes a number of technical, technical-ish changes um, to uh, driver and vehicle services uh, related sections of the law. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to start off with the A2 amendment, if I could. Senator Dipple moves the A2 amendment. And Madam Chair, the A2 amendment was prepared by council um, and is uh, technical in nature, nothing super substantive. Very good. So an author's amendment, the A2 amendment, uh, members, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. And the amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Dibble, to your bill as amended. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, Senate file 4067 has... nine or 10 things that it does. And rather than just enumerating them and then having that repeated by the agency, um, I'll just have Director uh, Zhang uh, uh, present the bill. Um, and then Madam Chair, um, I'll have another amendment. I'll we'll pause there and respond to questions. And then I'll have uh, an A1 amendment um, that's uh, more substantive in nature um, that's being advocated by the Deputy Registrars, Driver's License Agents, and I'll Mr. Hurst help us uh, understand that amendment. Very good. Uh, Director Zhang, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Pong Zhang, Director of the Driver and Vehicle Services Division. Madam Chair, members, uh, Senator Dibble, thank you. Um, <clears throat> this bill makes several technical and policy changes as referenced, uh, the first of which is it, it ensures that 10,000 pound trucks are included in the definition of a pickup truck. Um, Next is a clarification for veteran special plates um, for the congressionally chartered veteran service organizations, BFW, DAV, and American Legion, to ensure that uh, the vehicles titled in the name of the organization themselves also qualify for the special plate uh, as an entity. Um, this bill also eliminates the limitation for these veteran special plates to, to two sets uh, to be consistent with other veteran special plates which have no such limits. Um, this bill also adds the definition of state to the U.S. military basis on foreign soil. Uh, by including this definition, uh, we can ensure that individuals with Minnesota licenses who get DWIs on military bases on foreign soil will also have that conviction counted on their driving record here in Minnesota. Uh, and then a large portion of the bill moves uh, proof of identity documents from rule into statute and creates a separate section for each of the three credential types. Uh, the non-compliant, which is our standard credential, the real ID, and then enhanced um, our driver's license. Moving these from rule to statute and placing each credential in its own section will make the requirements easier for customers to understand and also simplify administration of these requirements. Um, this bill also expands the acceptance of tribal documents to include not only those issued by Minnesota tribal governments, but also um, any federally recognized tribe. It also makes technical corrections to the new teleconference and online driver education programs authorized last year. And then finally, this bill eliminates the requirement to uh, provide a document showing, a physical document showing your social security number when applying for a real ID. Uh, this is uh, consistent with federal guidance uh, and we, act, we verify the, the social security number through um, a, a database process no longer requiring that, that physical document. That is a walkthrough of the bill, and I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Members, any questions? Seeing none, Senator Dibble. 
Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I would like to offer the A2 amendments, um, but before we adopt it, uh, why don't we invite uh, uh, Mr. Hurst forward um, to talk about the proposal. Senator oh. Dibble moves the A1 amendment, correct? I'm sorry, A1. A1. I knew oh. I was going to goof that Senator Lang. <laughs> oh, got it. Yeah. The, uh, I'm sorry, the A1, yes. We adopted the A2, A1. The A1 amendment is before us. Uh, Mr. Hurst, thank please. you, Madam Chair and committee members. For the record, my name is Jim Hurst. I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Deputy Registrars Association. Uh, MDRA is a trade, trade group representing uh, the vast majority of uh, Minnesota's 169 deputy registrar and driver's license agent offices in the state. Uh, and they serve at the uh, convenience of the state and we are regulated by the uh, Division of Driver and Vehicle Services. The A1 amendment that is before you is uh, largely, uh, uh, it, it builds on uh, some of the uh, aspects of last year's omnibus bill and uh, also is in response to uh, a, a few things that we've, we've discovered, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, um, just recently. Uh, First of all, the, the first two sections, uh, starting at lines one through five, through one through one, th one three, as well as lines 1.17 through 131, uh, these are very comparable, but quite honestly, what it is is currently longstanding Minnesota rules uh, forbid auto dealerships, financial institutions, and auto insurance companies from having any ownership interest or stake in a deputy registrar or driver's license agent office. Uh, this is very smart and, and prudent because we do not want to see any undue influence from those entities uh, interfering with the work of the deputy registrar or driver's license agent because they are quite honestly auditors making sure that the information that comes to us is accurate and, and uh, sufficient to be passed on to the state for them to rubber st to uh, do the final approval on that type of transaction, whether it's a title uh, or a, a driver's license uh, credential. Uh, what this does is to extend that, <coughs> excuse me, what this does is extend that to state vendors. Most uh, commonly in, in statute, there is something called EVTR. EVTR is a software company that uh, dealerships use. It uh, is, is uh, uh, a wonderful application. The dealers love it, the deputies love it. Uh, however, we wanna make sure that a software company such as this is no different from the banks or auto, or auto uh, dealerships or auto insurance companies so that they don't have undue influence on the deputy registrars. Uh, the second half of this pertains to another vendor, which is kiosks. As you may recall, kiosks uh, became uh, 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 approved and is starting to be out in, uh, uh, in the metro area. But uh, uh, certainly these kiosks are, are not just in a deputy registrar office. They're in Cub Foods or other retail establishments. This just makes clear that a kiosk and the vendor who has the kiosk cannot become a deputy registrar or a DL agent going into the future. Uh, the third provision that is in the bill is on page two, lines 2.4 through 2.7. This concerns the ability for an individual to apply for a title uh, for a motor vehicle. Uh, there is a list of different credentials which are acceptable. Most recently, just last year, the year before uh, the uh, the individual applying, if they have a foreign consular card, that was an acceptable form of identification to complete this type of transaction. However, uh, a foreign passport is not in the list, and we figured that it would be very appropriate to include a foreign, a valid current passport as one of the options for an individual seeking to title a vehicle. Uh, with the passage of DL for All uh, last year, we have seen people coming in, uh, succeeding in applying for that type of credential. However, at the same time, they're like, now I would like to uh, title my vehicle. I used my foreign passport to, uh, as a form of identification in this instance for DL for All. 
but unfortunately we cannot uh, complete that type of transaction for a title for a vehicle uh, on the other hand. So this would just extend that into that. The last thing which uh, uh, truly uh, deals with the intent of legislation that was passed last year by this committee in the Omnibus Transportation Bill, and it was also a recommendation in the IER King report a couple years prior, and that was to encourage more limited driver's license agent offices to become full service providers. Driver's license agents in the state are, prime, are either full service, meaning they do uh, renewals, brand new applications and the like, or they're limited. Limited offices can only help you if you've lost your car during the current cycle and you just need a replacement. In those cases, these limited offices can do that and that's all they can do as it pertains to driver's licenses. Last year's legislation, uh, omnibus bill, appropriated three quarters of a million dollars to, the, uh, to DVS, in which case that was for the intent to reimburse these offices seeking to become full service operators. Uh, however, uh, the existing rules governing distance requirements um, got in the way. And so we had a number of offices, primarily in the rural part of the state, who were denied the ability to uh, upgrade to become full service. And it was because they were 22 miles from the local office instead of 25 miles away. Uh, it was things of that nature. So what we are proposing in this last section of the amendment is for a one-year period only, because we do, uh, uh, we do appreciate the rules in existence, but for one year, outside of the seven county metro area. Any office that is currently a, a limited office, limited driver's license agent, who wants to become a full service office may do so without the hindrance of the existing rules. But that would sunset after one year, so they would have this narrow window of opportunity to do it, and that also um, correlates with the appropriation, the $750,000 that I talked about, that uh, would uh, otherwise trans uh, would end by the end of the current biennium. And so by doing it this way, the money is there for these offices to do it, and we wouldn't have to come back to the legislature and ask for a new appropriation uh, after, the, after the current biennium. Uh, lastly, I just want to say that all of this has been vetted by the department, and DVS has indicated they have no concerns with the language as uh, proposed in the A1 amendment. And with that, I would be more than happy to answer any questions that any of you might have. Senator Dibble, any other comments before we move to questions? I think Mr. Hurst did a great job. Very good. <laughs> Members, questions or discussion? I'm sure. Uh, Senator Jasinski. Not about that one specifically, but about the bill. So uh, last year, I know the minority had a lot of concerns about uh, new driver's license for undocumented, uh, driver's license for all, and the, the concerned about all the documents that would be coming in and training um, uh, deputy registers on that and, and to verify that all the documents are appropriate and are, are accurate and, and not falsified. Uh, how is that going now? And can if you comment maybe... Uh, uh, Director Jong, as well as, as um, uh, Mr. Hurst, can address how that's going. I, I, I've heard some concerns over that. Uh, how is that going along right now? Mr. Hurst. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Jasinski. Uh, I only have anecdotal information. Certainly, uh, there has been a great demand in certain areas of state as opposed to others. Uh, and I'm not saying just strictly the metro, certainly. Uh, Rural areas to the west and south have certainly uh, seen a, an uptick. I've not been informed of any major issues concerning this. Uh, however, uh, unfortunately, I have heard some reports, and, and uh, again, I have no idea where this was, but uh, certainly there were some reports that individual customers who were not seeking this credential, uh, were acting inappropriate towards other customers that they thought were looking for such a credential. And uh, 
it, it didn't get to a, to a point where law enforcement had to be called out or anything, but it was very unfortunate, but it was very isolated in this one uh, area, and again, I have no idea where it was in the state, but um, that's all I can let to, uh, inform you of at this point, and I would certainly welcome the director if he has some information as well. Director Zhang. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Jasinski. <clears throat> Uh, training was, was a dedicated portion of the, our implementation plan for DL for All, and we worked closely with our D, DLA uh, partners to make sure that they had all the information uh, needed to be successful. Um, and as we expected, we, as we see more documents and learn more about this process, we're adapting and, and, and uh, providing that communication to our um, deputy registrar and DLA partners. Uh, we meet regularly with, with DRBOA and MDRA uh, leadership, and, as well as the larger DR and DLA community, um, so that we can identify and flag these kind of issues. And, and I will say that it's been a, a great partnership. We've been learning a lot together, and, uh, and we're, uh, docu we're documenting what we're learning and putting, uh, making the mo those materials ready or available for everyone. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you. That's it. Other questions or discussions? Senator Lang. Thank you, Madam Chair. A couple just small ones as I'm digging through here. What's uh, subdivision 26, the pickup truck one? What difference does the pound make? Director Zhang. Madam Chair, Senator Lang, um, it just clarifies that it includes 10,000. And so right now, um, anything over 10,000 is weighted. Up to 10,000 is, is, is uh, just a light, light passenger vehicle. Um, it, it, well, the language is unclear where if the truck was exactly 10,000. And so this uh, includes 10,000 into that um, passenger vehicle uh, classification, not Senator. weighted. Okay. So Senator Lang. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm guessing there's probably some manufacturers out there that came to you and said, we have 10,000 pound rated vehicles. Why does your law say this, correct? <laughs> Director Zhang. Madam Chair, Senator Lang. Uh, it, it wasn't manufacturers, actually, it was uh, deputy registrar partners and customers. Who okay. were uh, find, found themselves in these kind of in this particular predicament, and um, to be consistent with our with our guidance, we wanted to uh, uh, update statutes so that it reflected the guidance that we've been providing, which is ten thousand, including ten thousand. Right. So, Madam Senator Chair, Dibble. at present, uh, can only go up to nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine point nine nine, and once you get ten thousand, okay, so you're 100. in a different class. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Senator Lang. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Then the next question, uh, of course, the military base, uh, subdivision 47. What's the story with that one? Director Zhang. Madam Chair, Senator Lang. Yes, this makes it so that um, D DUI and DWI convictions that take place on, on military bases on foreign soil are also included. So right now, military uh, infractions on military bases on U.S. soil are included in the definition of state. We include those uh, those DWI, DUI infractions on their Minnesota driving record um, and, and count it towards the, the number of DUIs that they currently have on their driving record. Uh, this exception, though, is if, if for example, is a, a military base in Germany, um, even though we get the DUI or DWI reported to us, we cannot include it into their driving record because it's, um, it's not included in the definition of state. Senator Lang. Thank you, Madam Chair. And they, uh, I guess the question is, is there other states that do this? The other states that uh, obviously report back upon their soldiers? Um, and who is the, I mean, this is a change in statute that it's half of a sentence, but I think the implications of it are actually rather profound when it's when you start thinking about how exactly uh, our service members are treated overseas versus I, I'm curious as to other states what they do and then obviously who is asking for this um, is this something where the Department of Veterans Affairs or the US Army or or who came to you with this uh, request or is this something that the state is looking for Director Jean. Madam Chair, Senator Lang, um, this request was brought forward by DVS. Um, DVS staff who are, who are uh, managing and implementing um, uh, records for, this, for uh, Minnesotans identified this as an inconsistency, and it's really it's inconsistent with um, those who get infractions on U.S. soil. 
um, even military members who, who have infractions on, on U.S. soil. And so this is about uh, roadway safety. This is about consistency and in, 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 um, in those um, consequences of, of driving while drinking. Senator Dibble. Um, I'll, I guess I'll ask the follow-up and, and other states. Uh, this is consistent with the practice of other states. And we, Director uh, Zhang. And do we have the uh, data on that? Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Dibble, uh, we do know that other states uh, do you, do count these towards uh, driving our DUI infractions. Uh, we will we are working on getting those stats. We have a survey out right now to get an update from jurisdictions as to how they incorporate this. Um, all of these infractions do get reported to ANVA, which is which hosts all the DUI infractions for for uh, the country, and uh, Minnesota participates in that. Senator Lang, um, Senator Dibble. We'll get uh, thanks. Sorry, Madam Chair. Senator Lang, we'll, we'll get that information to you before we take final action on this. We're laying this bill over. So, Senator and, Lang. Thank you, Madam Chair. The only other thing I would say is that if they are in Germany and they get a DUI while they're in Germany, uh, obviously they're going to be prosecuted more than one time on a DUI, correct? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator, Senator Lang, I, Dibble. I, don't so think, I don't think that's the case. This is just for the purpose of recording that DUI that goes on their driving record. Senator Lang. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, so if you are on a, a military base in Germany, the German authorities have no uh, way of tracking you getting a DUI on that base? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm asking. I'm just saying in the United States, the civilians would know about a DUI that you got on a military base. And if you're overseas and you get a DUI on a military base, not only would Germany, I'm sure, whoever the foreign country may be, know about it and prosecute you, but now we're going to do it in Minnesota at the same time. So I'm a little iffy about how how do they be how are they prosecuted? How do the, how does that driver's license? I know it's just for tracking purposes, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> we're getting we're, now we're we're kind of getting them twice on this one. Just Director Jean. Madam Chair, Senator Lang, um, I can't speak for a prosecution on, of, uh, of DUI infractions on foreign soil, military bases on foreign soil. We, we know that um, uh, military bases have their own MPs, and, uh, and those, those bodies are the, are the enforcement arms of those on military bases, and they are the ones that write those tickets and provide those citations. As far as uh, pro the criminal aspect of it, I, I can't speak intelligent to, intelligently to that, and, and I will have to look, look into it more. Just as clarification, Director Zhang, this bill doesn't address uh, prosecution, merely reporting. Is that correct? Madam Chair, that is correct. Senator Lang. Nope. That's all. Senator Howell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I think we're still on the amendment for A1, but uh, that is correct. as far as... I'm going to hold my other questions until we get on the main bill again. But on this discussion, I would like to add that, you know, when you're in the military overseas, you don't have the same rights as we do here sitting in this great state of Minnesota. So your, your prosecution and, and your defense is not near what you'd have if you were here. So... I'm a little bit suspect as we're going to add that in and we're going to count it the same as if you got it prosecuted here in the state of Minnesota. And that's where I'm concerned. It's not that I'm uh, uh, supportive of folks that drive and drink, but or drink and drive. But my question is really, we are going to put the same standard as if they were prosecuted here with the same rights that they have here. And when you're overseas, and especially when you're in uniform, in a military uniform, you don't have those rights, especially in a military uniform. So that's my concern, is we're going to put that same standard and we're going to count it the same here, although it's not the same standard over there. So that's my comments on that, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Zhang, I'll ask you for comment, but also I'm going to tack a question on there to clarify that this is specific to uh, service people who are on a military base. Is that correct? Madam Chair, uh, Senator How and Madam Chair, yes, that is absolutely correct. Uh, these are infractions on military bases, and um, uh, what this bill, do what this, what this um, uh, language does is, it treats those military members who get a DUI on a base here in the U.S. the same as a military member who got a DUI on a base in on foreign soil. 
um, it's really about consistency across. It's it's a DUI on on military base, regardless of what country it's in. Senator, how any follow up? So, Madam Chair, Senator Dibble. I would uh, renew my motion on the A one. Any other comments on the A one? All right, members, uh, so we will, uh, on the motion to adopt the A1 amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes and the amendment is adopted. Um, Senator Dibble, any other comments uh, to your bill as amended? Um, no, Madam Chair. I mean, I'm, I'm, any I think other? Senator Howe might have had some yes. questions. Yes, uh, discussion on the bill as a whole as amended, Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair and uh, Senator Dibble. Uh, I always was, when I first got here, told that the repealer, the proof of a bill is always in the repealer. And as I look at this repealer, I believe it's, we're repealing this section to, to conform with federal law. My question is, is what is the federal law that we're trying to conform to and what, why don't we just put those items into the bill instead of taking this out? I guess that's my question. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you. I, I think that is the, the goal but I'll let uh, Director Zhang uh, respond. Director Zhang. Madam Chair, Senator Howe, yes, it's a, a real ID um, update that no longer requires the physical uh, um, social security card to be presented um, because we already do a, a electronic verification with um, the social security administration with the number itself. And so the presentation of the card is no longer required. The federal code has been updated and Minas we're just updating Minnesota law to reflect that. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair and Director Jong. Can they, t can they tell when there's multiple people, you know, because Social Security numbers get stolen, can they, when a multiple name pops up, uh, does anybody get notified or does that ever happen when you go into that system? Because uh, people are still in numbers quite regularly in, in this day and age, sorry to say. Director Jong. Madam Chair, Senator Howe, um, that Social Security number check is real time. We have uh, live access, a uh, live interaction with so the Social Security Administration. That transaction cannot complete unless there's an actual match. And so when, when a customer comes in and presents documentation, it'll have documentation with their name, date of birth information that matches that Social Security number. When we, that Social Security number is, is submitted to social, the Social Security Administration for verification, that validation comes back and it needs to match exactly the application that was provided. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And one follow-up, Director Zhang, is does that same verification follow with the ITIN then also? Director Zhang. M Madam Chair, Senator Howe, can you repeat the last part of that question? The individual tax identification number, the alternate to a social security number. Director Zhang. Madam Chair, Senator Howe, uh, we, we do, we're not authorized to use the, uh, the individual tax identification number as a, as a um, uh, in lieu of the social security number. Um, the, Credential application, driver's license, or, or Minnesota ID requires a social security number um, if you provide uh, um, U.S. documents. Senator Howe. Okay. Other discussion or questions, members? Any closing comments, Senator Dibble? Um, no. Um I appreciate the time and attention um, on the ITIN question, Senator Howe. We're, we're going to lay this on the table, so we'll, you know, we can come back to it uh, when we have the omnibus. So, uh, or you know, if members have any questions in the meantime, um, between now and, and Friday, um, shoot them to me or to Mr. Greenfield or to the agency, uh, and we'll try to respond to those or have, be ready for those questions for the omnibus. Thank you. Very good. That Senator. being said, Senate File 4067, as amended, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. The next bill will be Senate File 3949, Senator McEwen.
Welcome to your committee, Senator McKeon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, yes. And proceed whenever you are ready. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just wanted to make sure um, that uh, my understanding is that the path of this bill is that it would also potentially be laid over for possible inclusion. Is that, that um, is correct. the chair's understanding? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, Mr. Chair, I also have um, a couple of amendments, if I may tend to those first before I begin the discussion of the bill. I'd like to um, introduce a couple of amendments that reflect some of the discussion that has been ongoing between different stakeholders to try to get this bill in a piece in the valley. Um, Very good. Um, we, have, uh, the, we have the A-10 in our packets. Is there an additional amendment? I do not have an A-10. I have an A-9 and I have an A-11 that is some, reflects just a couple of small changes to the A-9. The A-9 is a delete all. Mr. Greenfield. Thank you. Oh, maybe it was renumbered from what I have. Mr. Chair and Senator McEwen, that's correct. The A-9 was updated briefly to the A-10 and the timestamp should be 3.15 at 6 p.m. It's the most current version of the A-10. Um, I believe that's also posted on the committee webpage. And Thank the A-11 is an amendment to the A-10. Thank you very much, perfect. Very good. All right, so uh, Senator McEwen will move the uh, A-10. All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, opposed say no. Motion carries. And then, um, would your intention be to take the A11 at this time? I would like to do that, All yes, right. Mr. Chair. All right. We don't think, I don't think we have that in our packets, unless I'm, we do not. So if we could have that passed around. And um, Senator McEwen. That's the 10, yeah, thank you. Okay, suspend for one moment. We are locating the A11. Thank you. No, there's not. So we'll, we'll get a presentation from Mr. Greenfield on what the changes of the A11 are, and then we'll have you make your presentation, then when it shows up, we'll uh, take action on the A11. How does that sound? That sounds perfect. Thank you, Great. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Greenfield. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, sorry that a physical copy hasn't been distributed, so we're gonna do a little engrossing to the DE on the fly. <laughs> I apologize. Um, on page two of the Delete Everything, um, there is reference to a 10-year time period um, that after conversations with Senator McEwen and the department has been changed to four years. Okay, so beginning on page two, line 13, uh, we are deleting the phrase, must give a 10-year, 10 hyphen year, and insert, comma, as much as practicable, comma, must give a four hyphen year. And that is to reflect unforeseen circumstances that might result in a relocation. On page two, line 15, before the word highway, uh, insert the word interstate. This is to reflect the intention of the author that this apply to interstate highways. And page two, line 17, this is the other provision pertaining to the 10 year requirement. We are deleting 10 hyphen year and inserting four hyphen year. And so those are the three changes that are incorporated in the A11 and should be posted soon on the committee page. And we'll take action on that when the A11 is in front of us. So Senator McEwen, why don't you proceed with your, the presentation of your bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members, uh, for your time today in hearing Senate File 3949. In the interest of time, I will be brief. Uh, Senate File 3949 requires 
MnDOT to open their rights of way to utilities for the co-location of high voltage transmission lines unless there is a public safety concern. With load growth expected to explode due to reshoring of manufacturing, data centers, electrification, and fulfilling our state's clean energy and net zero goals, new transmission lines are absolutely imperative. We want utilities to have the option to run high voltage transmission lines in public rights of way wherever possible rather than purchasing easements on private property or going through an imminent domain process. I want to note this bill does not require utilities to co-locate in already existing public rights of ways. It is the utility's choice as to whether or not they utilize this tool. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'm going to turn it over to my testifier in support of this bill, Randy Satterfield, Mr. Randy Satterfield, to explain more about this bill. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Senator. Chair <clears throat> Dibble, uh, Vice Chair Morrison, uh, Lee Jasinski, and members of the committee, uh, I'm Randy Satterfield, Executive Director of NextGen Highways. NextGen Highways Minnesota appreciates the opportunity uh, to provide testimony on Senate File 3949. We applaud this committee's consideration of important provisions related to accelerating deployment of high voltage transmission infrastructure critical to Minnesota's energy future. NextGen Highways Minnesota is a coalition of labor, industry, and environmental partners who support policies that can help speed the process of siting transmission lines while also impacting fewer landowners and communities. Simply put, NextGen Highways Minnesota seeks to give utilities and other transmission developers another tool in their toolbox for siting high voltage transmission. NextGen Highways has its roots in Minnesota and neighboring Wisconsin, where utilities and the Wisconsin Department of Transportation have been successfully siting transmission lines in state and federally funded highway rights of way for nearly 20 years. In fact, Excel Energy and American Transmission Company jointly, the jointly owned Badger Cooley line uses 100 miles of Interstate 90-94 uh, right of way. And for reference, I spent nearly 20 years at American Transmission Company uh, helping to site and permit hundreds of miles of transmission. NextGen Highways collaborated with the Minnesota Department of Transportation over a period of nearly two years to investigate the feasibility of siting transmission in interstate rights of way, culminating in a feasibility study published in the spring of 2022. While this study identified critical considerations for successfully siting transmission in highway rights of way, all challenges identified are surmountable through proactive coordination and planning between the utility and the DOT. SF3949 provides a highly popular option to ensure all public right of way along interstates and highways are open to co-location of high voltage transmission. The state regulations currently prohibiting this option in interstate rights of way are based on both old federal guidance, which has since been rescinded, and arbitrary state statutes that have nothing to do with the technical, economic, or social feasibility of constructing high voltage transmission in interstate rights of way. Moreover, in a public opinion poll, nearly 80% of Minnesotans who said they preferred co-location of transmission with public rights of way suggest this is a policy that must be passed now. Minnesota NextGen Highways continues to engage stakeholders, including utilities and MnDOT, on a common sense solutions to help realize our shared goal of considering the co-location of transmission infrastructure in highway and interstate rights of way when and where it makes sense. The urgency is real. Minnesota committed to 100% carbon-free electricity by 2040 just 16 years from now. In the world of transmission planning and deployment, that's barely the blink of an eye. We appreciate Chair Dibble's leadership, Senator McEwen's leadership, and this committee's consideration and support of this important policy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Satterfield. Uh, questions, members? All right, uh, I see there are a couple of other Testifiers, Senator McEwen. Um, so we'll invite yes. Kayla Christensen forward from the Minnesota Conservative Energy Forum and Adam Trombley from Nobles Cooperative Electric. 
Uh, Chair Welcome. Dillon. Thank you. Chair Dillon, members of the committee, I'm Kayla Christensen, Executive Director of the Minnesota Conservative Energy Forum. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and thank you to Senator McEwen for bringing forward this bill. Um, the Minnesota Conservative Energy Forum is a nonprofit education and advocacy organization that promotes market-based all of the above energy strategy for Minnesota. I'm pleased here to be here today to share MNCEF's support for Senate File 3949 as amended. Uh, MNCEF's field program, the Land and Liberty Coalition, serves as a resource and provides education across the state to the public and local policymakers, often in areas where utility scale renewable projects are being proposed. We are in the field and able to hear directly from the people most affected by these projects. Um, transmission lines are what we often hear the most questions and concerns about. The leading questions are, one, why can't we bury the lines? And two, why can't we put them along transportation corridors where room allows for this kind of infrastructure? The answer to the first question is it's extremely expensive to bury high voltage transmission lines and they are very difficult to repair. But the answer to the second question is one we have been seeking for a number of years. Landowners are often aware of our transmission needs, but they see the land along the transportation corridors already developed to serve the public not being used and are not being able to be used for co-location. Instead, they see developers seeking private land by agreement or in some cases with utilities using eminent domain to site transmission. Your constituents are asking for this. At the beginning of March, MISO released its preliminary plans for tranche two. This project would be a great candidate to take advantage of this policy. Landowners along these new routes can have confidence that they will that the state will not be buying unnecessary land for fear of eminent domain utilities will have a process by which they can seek co-location and we're prudent in transportation corridors wisconsin where this idea came from has developed near 200 miles of transportation lines in transportation corridors for almost 20 years and not one pole has needed to be moved because departments were working together from the beginning while there are discussions still happening about cost sharing, we are confident we can get to an agreement that works for MnDOT and utilities. Um, this legislation provides Minnesota the opportunity to maximize utilization of existing resources, prioritize expediency, minimizes costs of acquiring land, and protects private property rights while still ensuring the highest standards of safety. This bill just isn't something that only industry groups want. We hear from your constituents on a weekly basis about why can't we put them in the interstate corridor. This is creating another tool and putting uh, to use during project planning, giving the PUC, utilities, developers, MnDOT, and communities flexibility. We urge you to support Senate File 3549 as amended. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Trombley, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Adam Trombley. I'm the CEO and General Manager of Nobles Cooperative Electric. Since this is the Transportation Committee and some may not be familiar with the cooperative business model, allow me to give a brief background as it impacts our view on this bill. There are 44 distribution cooperatives who provide safe, reliable, and affordable electricity 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Each of those 44 distribution cooperatives has a unique service territory. Electric cooperatives serve 85% of the geographical area in the state, but we only serve 1.7 million Minnesotans. We are locally governed, we do not earn a rate of return, and we serve some of the poorest counties in Minnesota. We, should, we appreciate that Senate File 3949 does not mandate utilities locating power lines in interstate right of way, and we appreciate having MnDOT become involved in siting discussions early in the process. However, we strongly oppose the cost shift portion of the DE amendment. Section 4, beginning on line 2.19 of the amendment, shifts the re relocation cost burden on the interstate freeways to the utility. The section allows for cost recovery. First, electric cooperatives do not get a cost recovery. We are governed by our boards. If there is a cost, our members pay that cost. My cooperative serves an area around Interstate 90. My cooperative serves 6,700 members. Hypothetically, let's talk about a project where we'd have to re relocate a line from the interstate right away. Let's pretend that cost was $100 million. If my 6,700 members have to pay the full re relocation costs, that's approximately $15,000 per member. Even if MnDOT wants us to move early, by this amendment, my members would still have to pay for 25% of the relocation costs at $3,700 per member. 
I don't believe my members have that to spend on relocation projects, and I'm sure I'm not sure many of many members of the committee has constituents who can pay that. Utilities currently have to pay relocation costs for trunk highway right of way relocations. That is why we work with our wholesale power supplier to make sure we think about cost. We need to balance the need to upgrade the system with potential future costs to members. If the relocation of facilities on interstate is meant to ben benefit the entire state's transportation system, why should only a few have to pay that cost? Again, we aren't an investor-owned utility. We don't get a guaranteed rate of return. We don't get cost recovery from the PUC. If something costs, our members pay it. This legislation would also undermine the public interest in facilitating the cost-effective deployment of transmission to support the energy transition and serve the substantial increase in electric demand that is on the horizon. We respectfully request that cooperatives be exempt the cost shift in section four. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Trombley. Good. Questions, thank members? All right. Mr. Chair. Oh, Senator Jasinski. Thank you, I have a question. I just wanna get this clarified, so I'm just trying to bring this down to my local community. So I have Highway 60, Minnesota Highway 60, it comes right through the middle of our town right through historic district and, and Faribault has the second most number of historic properties in the state of Minnesota outside St. Paul. So with this bill, you're telling me that we could put a, a, a power line down the middle of the road or in the right of way through our community with no local control. Is that correct? Senator McKim. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Jasinski, for the question. Um, I'm going to um, seek um, some expertise here from our expert testifier. Yes, yeah, Senator. Mr. Satterfield. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator, my not fully appreciating the nature of that highway. It sounds like it might be. Uh, Mr. Satterfield, if you could move your. Uh, it sounds like it might be a state trunk highway. It's Minnesota Highway 60. Right? Yeah, so I think the law already allows for transmission lines to be built in that highway. The, the, the bill being considered here is for federally aided highways, primarily interstate highways. So with respect to the highway you're referencing, the law would already allow for a transmission line to be cited there. However, I can share from kind of my personal experience in citing transmission infrastructure, you rarely cite high voltage transmission um, through the center of towns, um, especially small towns, which is probably why there's not a transmission line cited there now. Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski. Can we have someone from MnDOT come up and confirm that? I guess I guess I just want to make sure. I, I, I saw it said interstate, but it also said highway and, and Minnesota highway. So again, I want to make sure uh, what's going on now. This does not apply to that. Again, it comes right through the middle of our town. Uh, it doesn't go down the main street, but it crosses over. And if this would apply, uh, then I put a high or a, a transmission line down the middle of the town through the historic district. I want to just verify that's not possible. Uh, so, Mr. Rudine, if you could answer that, please. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Rudine. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Eric Rudine with MnDOT Government Affairs. And no, I, I don't think there's anything in here that would require us to, to locate a utility in that situation. As was pointed out, it, it would currently be allowed today if, if there was room, um, you know, which would probably mean like an underground installation, I would imagine, in a in a historic district like that, I think you know we would uh, we would not be permitting something to to run down a, a like a high voltage line down a downtown street because there just wouldn't be room for for those types of poles. So this, I think, would be more in a you know an undeveloped area, um, which is uh, if you're familiar with the CapEx project, for example, up along I-94. I think it's it's sort of uh, intended to. Uh, to get at those types of situations. Senator Chesinski. Well, again, I'm just looking at line 1.10 on the original bill, and I guess maybe on the DE, but it says along any trunk highway. So Highway 60 is a trunk highway, correct? Mr. Rudy, or Senator McKeown. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Chesinski, yes, Highway 60 is a, a, a state trunk highway. Mm -hmm. Um, that's correct, but it, it, it currently is permissible 
today to to install uh, utilities along trunk highways. So it, I don't know that this would um, this would change that. It, you know, you can see the the language there starting on 1.11, except as deemed necessary to protect public safety or ensure the proper function of the trunk highway system. So I think in this situation you're you're talking about you know we could argue that. Um, there, there would be public safety considerations to putting, you know, high voltage poles in a downtown area. Yeah, they must try. So I just wanted to verify that because again, the way I read it, uh, it basically would allow that uh, through the DE that it's, it would be allowed. It's up to MnDOT's discretion, but basically, if you decided that was the only way through, you could technically MnDOT could make that happen. Correct, Mr. Rudy. Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, I, again, I think for a, a trunk highway, it, it currently is allowed already, but um, I don't think we would say that's an appropriate place, and I don't think the utilities would also desire to, to put a high voltage line, um, for example, in, in that location. Mr. Chair. Senator McKim. Thank you. And Senator Jasinski, I... I um, I share this concern that you're raising. I certainly wouldn't want to see a high voltage transmission line go through a historic old downtown. I don't think anybody would. But it sounds to me like it already exists in law, not here, not with the DE, but separately in the law that that could already happen. Um, it is not happening. If you're interested in um, creating further protections to make sure that that would never happen. I would love to join with you and perhaps draft um, some separate legislation. But my understanding is that the, this DE doesn't in any way open up a new avenue toward doing that that doesn't already exist. And thank you, Michelle. I just want to get that a record because, again, I, I didn't know the, the law before, uh, but that would be awfully concerning to me if this it would expand that capability uh, to go through, you know, that type of an area with highly populated, you know, I-94 I, I think is a little different, but I would also have the concern there if I lived there uh, of the same issue. But thank you. You answered my concern, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess my question is I, I, I think this bill is probably – a good bill when it comes to having power lines in the in the right of way of roads, uh, and I think that you probably know in my district the the hot new topic right now is the, the XL Energy pipe or the XL Energy uh, high voltage power line that's going through, you know, a couple of thousand uh, a couple thousand landowners of property uh, as it comes through about five or six different counties within my district. So um, my question is priority. Um, at this point in time, is, does MnDOT take a, or the utilities, do they take a, a stance on what would be the priority? Because uh, in my viewpoint, it, it seems as though this may be a priority to put in a roadway in my district, out in the middle of nowhere. Let's just be honest, it's not down, it's scenic downtown. This is uh, roadways uh, in the prairie um, versus going across someone's field. Now, obviously, cost is going to be an issue. So as, as of a matter of priority, how does MnDOT view that? Mr. Rudy. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Lang, I think um, the language is, is directing the department to, if we get an application for a utility location, uh, we basically have to say yes unless we can demonstrate that there's a safety concern or some sort of operational concern for the trunk highway. So I, again, I think the default would be allow it unless there's a really good reason not to allow it. Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, I, and I, I heard the author say before, and I'm in total agreement on this, that I think that this is a, a good way of, of uh, having high power transmission uh, versus imminent domain, because that's what we're talking about in Southwest Minnesota, is we're talking about, you know, hundreds of miles of imminent domain. I don't know if anybody has any comment that they want to make on that one because it's a it's a hot topic. Yeah. Priority of yeah. Mr. Satterfield. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Senator uh, Lang, um, I referenced in my testimony uh, the Badger Cooley line, which is jointly owned by Excel Energy and my former employer, American Transmission Company. That line travels from <clears throat> Madison, Wisconsin, up to La Crosse, Wisconsin and utilizes 100 miles of the Interstate 90-94 corridor. 
uh, that 100 miles uh, of use of the interstate highway corridor uh, meant that three to 400 private property landowners were not impacted uh, by that project. And that's exactly what we're trying to get at with, with this piece of legislation, because right now in Minnesota, the DOT does not allow consideration of interstate highway corridors, which often are the most valuable for consideration of co-location. Do they always work? Absolutely not, right? You know, DOTs may have plans to expand highways. Wouldn't make sense to build a transmission line in a highway that's gonna be expanded because you'd have to relocate, and that's a headache for a lot of folks. But in other cases, like we found uh, in Wisconsin with the 9094 corridor, there was, because it's an interstate, there's ample uh, uh, room uh, for uh, a high voltage uh, transmission line co-location all the while while bothering fewer private landowners and considering Minnesota's statute to decarbonize by 2040 right you're going to be deploying more and more clean energy resources and those resources right because of the nature of them solar and wind facilities they're deployed in rural communities uh, and it's often those rural communities that we also call upon to host transmission facilities. So kind of our approach is that we kind of owe it to those rural landowners who are hosting society's generation infrastructure, right, to let them know we're considering other linear infrastructure corridors for the deployment of transmission assets. And interstate highways are just a prime example of uh, linear infrastructure corridors that are ripe for co-location. All right, Senator Chizinski. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And that just brings up, you know, the bill. I understand, in, in essence, what, what we're doing here. And I know we're, we're going to the green way of things. Uh, but the 2040, you know, that time frame, tell me how you think it's going to change Minnesota's landscape with these high transmission lines, what we have to do. Um, you know, I, we've always thought Minnesota's beautiful, and you look over the scenic, you know, prairies and fields. Uh, to get to the 2040 requirements, how is our landscape going to change as far as the aesthetics of our area? I mean, how many transmission lines? You said there's a huge need for them. So how, how far apart are we going to be seeing these, and how will it change the landscape of Minnesota and the aesthetics right now? I mean, that's my concern is we're, we're seeing more and more requirements for them. You know, Minnesota is a beautiful place with the lakes and the, all those things. It just would be a concern of mine of what's the power lines going to look like as far as the number increasing from now to say 2040. Mr. Satterfield. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, I, I, I don't know that I, well, let me rephrase. I don't have the answer uh, to that question. I don't, I don't know how many uh, additional transmission lines will be needed. More will be needed, there is no doubt. Um, and no doubt uh, aesthetic concerns are real and legitimate concerns. Uh, in helping to site hundreds of miles of transmission in Wisconsin over nearly 20 years. Uh, we dealt with those concerns on, on nearly every project uh, that we implemented. What I can tell you from my experience in Wisconsin is that uh, because we uh, were uh, required by statute to consider the use of highway corridors as well as existing transmission line corridors, when we were able to utilize uh, existing utility or highway corridors for transmission lines, that, that eased the burden uh, in communities that, were, that, that could have been impacted but were not impacted. Uh, I would make an argument that if you can locate a transmission line where there's already infrastructure corridors, you are helping to preserve an aesthetic beauty, right? A highway is already a disturbed corridor uh, to some degree. Um, it is a prime place to place a transmission line as opposed to potentially clear-cutting uh, a new transmission line across a, a greenfield area. So while I don't have the answer to how many more transmission lines there are going to be, what I, what I, what I can say uh, based on my experience is that when you can cite and permit transmission lines where there is already public infrastructure corridors, uh, you help to ease any effects um, on the aesthetic beauty of, of the countryside. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you. I have uh, Senator Howe. Howe, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I guess one of the concerns I have is we're putting in an additional, and I, I kind of like following the interstates, uh, the idea of keeping them out of people's backyards. Uh, as Senator Lang said, that transmission line coming from the southwest is coming through my district, and uh, it is a very uh, hot topic of discussion, to say the least. Uh, the question I have is, we have all kinds of agencies out there denying all kinds of things. Why do we make the commissioner of, of uh, transportation respond within 90 days of a denial when we don't have that requirement on anyone else when they deny an MPCA permit or, or DNR denies a permit? How come we're... Uh, requiring MnDOT, the Commissioner MnDOT, to uh, to respond with a denial within 90 days. Senator McKeown. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that question. Um, my understanding is that, I mean, the contents of this bill, including timelines, have been developed in discussion with the agency, with the various stakeholders, and this is the amount of time that is needed. Um, the 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 things, the other uh, processes for permitting and whatnot that you're alluding to, uh, I, I don't have a sort of a measure in front of me of what those officials say that they would need in terms of timing to make those decisions, so I can't really speak to them. But I can say that um, the timing that is reflected in this bill does reflect that type of collaboration and consultation. Senator Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess my, my point is, is, is that I'm not worried about the 90 days. I'm just saying, do we trust MnDOT less than these other agencies that don't have to report anything? I guess that's that's kind of my question. Uh, but with that, then, if you're going to have, and I, I see in here also that within 30 days of receiving a written request, the commissioner has to assign a project coordinator. Does MnDOT have folks sitting there waiting for these projects to come, or are those additional people? Um, that's Eric Rudine. He's going to handle all of these. Personal. <laughs> <laughs> he's just sitting when there he's waiting. When he's not here. He's just sitting there waiting for work. <laughs> Mr. Rudy. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Howe, um, you know, this, the, the language from the A-10, although we have been discussing mm -hmm. it for a while, we didn't really get the, the A-10 until, I think, Friday afternoon. So I think that's going to have to be something we'll need to look at. Yeah, we don't have extra staff just, you know, sitting around, but we do have staff that deal with utility permits, mm -hmm. and so, um, you know, we'll have to take a look at whether uh, we need some additional resources there. I think, obviously, part of it depends on how many applications we get. You know, despite the legislation, we might get, you know, one application in the next two years. Uh, it's hard to say, but um, I think we'd have to just kind of see how many... Um, proposals come forward and, and deal with it uh, at that time. Right, Senator I'm Al. just looking at the cost, and, and if there happens to be a cost, I think that would have a direct effect on what we're looking at here. So I, as you know, normally you put a, you always assume that the, you're going to, either it's a half a FTE or a full FTE or whatever it may be, and or it's a negligible expense. Uh, whatever it is, but I just, when I looked at that, that's the, the red flag that popped up. Well, if it does trigger a fiscal impact, um, then we'll have to do it <coughs> in, in the uh, second uh, omnibus. So thank you for flagging that. We'll keep an eye on that. Um, all right, anything further? Senator Jasinski. Mr. Chair, sorry, that just sparked tonight, you know, a question of Senator Howe, so you know, we don't have the same thing for a pipeline, so there's, you know, pair, appears that we have uh, something for a, a high transmission line, but not a pipeline, and we're expediting it for the transmission line, but we're not saying about a pipeline. And why should there be a preference or a different requirement, one versus the other? I think, uh, you know, there's been a lot of pipeline stuff that wants to go through, and there's no uh, time limit put on them, but now we're putting a time limit on a, a high transmission line, so. Uh, you know, why the inconsistency for a high transmission line versus a pipeline? It doesn't, you know, technically sound fair to me. So why would we give one preference over the other? Senator McKeown. 
thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that question, Senator Jasinski. Um, I'm, I'm all ears if people want to bring some ideas, but I think that this bill specifically is dealing with the issue of moving to a clean energy system and the transmission that we anticipate needing to facilitate that and thinking ahead to these issues that you have raised over the course of the hearing the the um, aesthetic, the issue of uh, problematic imminent domain and all of the things that go with that. So I, I really see the issue that you're raising right now in terms of pipelines, that's a different lane and um, I think we can entertain those issues and talk through them and the process and if it's appropriate or not and um, but this what this has to deal with is the transmission line issue and the right-of-way issue and, and perhaps um, our testifiers have additional thoughts as well. Mr. Satterfield. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Senator, I, I am not a pipeline expert, but I believe most pipelines are, are, are cited and permitted through federal uh, permitting processes as opposed to state processes and transmission lines uh, are the purview of the states to site and permit. So I think that's uh, an important distinction. And then just if I could also just one last uh, or one point to Senator uh, Howe's question around um, the timing from uh, the DOT secretary. I know some of the stakeholders that we work with through our coalition um, wanted to put some time frames in there t and, 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 and um, uh, responsibilities of, this, of, of the commissioner to ensure that any denials of potential co-location aren't always just couched necessarily in um, in kind of one denial category, you know, safety, for example. So, you know, our stakeholders wanted to ensure that if uh, MnDOT gave a thorough review that they had insight into what those denial kind of triggers were uh, for, the, for the potential co-location project. All right, anything further, members? We do have the A11 before yes. us. Senator McEwen renews her motion on the A11. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Members, anything further on 3949? All right, with that, uh, we will lay uh, Senate File 3949 as amended uh, for on the table for possible future inclusion in an omnibus bill. Um, and we're going to jump ahead, members. Uh, Senator Westland is with us. And so we'll invite Senator Westland to the table to present Senate File 4599. Welcome to the committee, Senator Westland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just pr please proceed whenever is convenient for you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am the chief author of this bill today um, regarding providing some additional security services specifically for the Office of the State Auditor. Um, currently, the Office of the State Auditor uh, is not covered by the security services that are provided to other constitutional officers. And um, this is a request basically to bring some parity in the security operations provided to the office of the, the auditor um, that is similar to the other constitutional officers. And um, I believe Auditor Blaha can provide you far more detail than I can about uh, the, si the situation with her office and the basis for her request. Um, thank you. Before that, we will ask... Uh Ms. Boyd, uh, to present the fiscal notes. Uh, Mr. Can you hear me, Mr. Chair and members? Um, there is a fiscal note. I should note that it's currently being revised. Um, the first version of the fiscal note did not pick up costs from the Secretary of State, uh, Attorney General, and uh, State Auditor's Office, so those will be added. Um, but I can speak to what's before us. Um, just very briefly, um, on page four uh, of the fiscal note, there's some language stating that the, um, the new language will require the state patrol to provide security for these three additional locations. Um, the costs that are summed up in this 
Fiscal note are related to staffing. Um, six non-sworn capital security officers, one sworn state trooper, and six additional dispatchers will be required. And that sums up to a cost of roughly 1.6 million in fiscal year 25, and then 1.4 million roughly in each fiscal year thereafter, and that's from the general fund. Thank you. Um, Auditor Blaha, if I may ask a favor of you. Um, Colonel Langer um, needs to, oh, he's fine, never mind. <laughs> okay, so go ahead, uh, Auditor Blaha. I'll make it quick. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair Dibble, uh, Vice Chair Morrison, Ranking Member Jasinski, and members of the committee. Um, our goal here is to bring the level of security for the Office of the State Auditor more in line with other constitutional officers. Not, not to expand it for the other officers, just include my personal, primary office space. Now, we've been having discussions around this issue since I took office um, five years ago, and in a more urgent way after January 6th, and then again after recent protests at the State Board of Investment. Now, the, the challenge of uh, bringing my security into better alignment is hindered by the definitions of the jurisdiction of capital security. So we've tried a couple of the solutions. You know, we've made changes to our, to our space at 525 Park. Uh, for a little more than a year, I had my offices in the Centennial Building. Uh, but due to the state office building construction, I was asked to cede that area for house members and am back in my original office space at 525 Park Street. Now, for those of you who don't know, it's the red building, Kitty Wampus, behind this building. Uh, so I just walk Kitty, cro Kitty Corner across the street, and here I am. Uh, now, long term, the answer may be a permanent space for the state auditor in the Capitol campus, but until then, uh, we need some improvements. Uh, our office met with the Advisory Committee on Capital Area Security on January 23rd to talk, discuss this issue and give them a sense of what we were needing. Um, now, that discussion is not entirely reflected in this fiscal note, and I think uh, there might be a misunderstanding there. Uh, we focused on merely the personal primary office of the officer herself, right? It's um, uh, in addition, we ask for some more modest services that we see in here. Now, finally, I think there is a misunderstanding of what is the capital area, and I believe the Secretary of State and Attorney General's addition, uh, additional offices that they're talking about here are south of that boundary. That capital area just goes just on the other side of the freeway, goes to about 11th Street, and their offices are both south of that. Uh, again, if you've ever served on a CAP board task force, you know this is a very, very common, <laughs> common question about What's what on there? Basically, uh, the change will make progress toward parity in basic security among the constitutional offices, and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Auditor Blaha. Um, I do think uh, Colonel Langer does have some thoughts that he'd like to share. We just don't need, didn't need to rush him out of here as quickly as I thought. So, <laughs> got, got kind thank of you. Uh, welcome, Colonel Langer. Mr. Chair, members, for the record, my name is Matt Langer. I have the honor and privilege of serving as Colonel of the State Patrol. And I, I think our, our concern is really twofold. Uh, one is where we get the people. So I just want to temper the expectations. And I've had this conversation with Auditor Blaha. So a fiscal note is one thing. And even if we get the funds, that's another. But then finding the people is, is, is one of the issues, both sworn and non-sworn. The other issue that we have um, is that we're concerned, and as I read it and research it, I still have some concern. If we're just limiting the expansion of the security services that we provide literally to one building that's adjacent to the Capitol complex, that's one scenario to get our heads around. But as we read the language, I, I still have questions, and I'm not saying I'm right versus what others have said, but I still have concerns. I think future auditors, future secretaries of state, future attorney generals, and where it could expand, where there's an office that is eight miles away from the headquarters of, of the Capitol complex or 200 miles away, like how we would provide security services when it's not immediately adjacent to the current Capitol complex is just a concern we have that I don't think we still have good grounding on whether or not this language, I know that's not the intent of what we're doing right now, but could this language in the future be used to, um, to put us in a position where we're, we're trying to provide security services, uh, so to speak, on an island? Thank you, Colonel Langer. All right, is there anyone further who would like to testify on this bill? All right, questions, members? All right. Well, thank you. Um, with that, that was 
quick and easy. We will lay Senate File 4599 on the table for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. Obviously, members, because this uh, draws, you know, fairly substantial general fund uh, fiscal notes, um, we won't be considering it this week. It'll be in a future omnibus bill. Thank you, Senator Westland. All right, so going back to the order, uh, Senator Carlson has a series of three proposals. And we can just take them in order as they appear, starting with Senate File 4488. Welcome to your committee, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm bringing Senate File 4488 which uh, actually goes back into my history of uh, dealing with car seats, uh, the child passenger uh, restraint provisions, and we're modifying the description. That, there's a lot of things that have happened since we put this into, into statute, and that is that car designs have changed, seat designs have changed, and federal re regulations have changed. So there's a lot of little, there are a lot of small things that have changed, and we're <coughs> Excuse me. We're just updating the language to fit the uh, more the, fit the federal changes and also the uh, designs of what we need to have as uh, safety regulations. We are also taking away the uh, um, let's see the the lowest level of uh, violation uh, for not using a booster seat. Seat. There are lots of booster seats around now, and, and people are getting them from. Uh, uh, there are a lot of hand-me-downs. So there's uh, many statements here about what has changed, and uh, I, I guess I could go through them, or I could just have uh, um, my, my testifier here, uh, Mr. Hansen, describe what, uh, what has brought this on. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Hansen. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Mike Hansen. I have the privilege of serving as the director for the Department of Public Safety's Office of Traffic Safety. Um, as Senator Carlson uh, described, really what we're looking at is a technical and um, a modern, uh, modernization of the child passenger safety regulations uh, that are on the books in Minnesota. Um, what we're doing is bringing Minnesota in line with nationally recognized best practices for what seat our most precious cargo our kids should be in so that those child passenger safety systems can do their job in the event that uh, a crash does occur. And so um, we're updating the language. We're trying to clean it up and make it easier for parents to understand. Um, as a grandparent of two little boys, I understand how much these things have changed since my sons were uh, young uh, back in the 1980s and 1990s. And so uh, it really does bring us into compliance with the current best practices, making the law a little bit cleaner, and recognizing that really there's three critical components that, that all have to work together when it comes to protecting our kids in our cars. First of all, it's the size and the age of the child. Um, every seat is not right for every child, and it's up, for, up to us at DPS to educate parents about that. But vehicles, as I think all of us recognize, are all very different these days, and they all have very different capabilities when it comes to the child passenger safety systems that are available out there. And then there's the seats themselves. They really run the gamut uh, all over the place for what they can do, what they should do, um, but really what uh, they're designed to do with a child of a given size and a given age. And so this language just helps us to clean all that up and hopefully make it more understandable for Minnesota parents. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hansen. Um, would anyone else like to testify on Senate File 4488? Seeing none, uh, questions from the committee. Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm curious, I'm just digging through this kind of for the first time in totality. Um, this looks very familiar to, and uh, coming from a parent that had kids in car seats not too, too long ago, this looked very familiar to the guidelines that Minnesota had always published. Um, can, I, I'm assuming that that's where these came from. These look very similar to the guidelines that were, it was always very hard to find the law, the way the law was actually done. Uh, and specifically speaking, my kids do not fit into all of the guidelines that were in the guidelines. 
Uh, so when it came to the law, you had to go dig a little bit further before you could find the law on all the websites throughout the state of Minnesota. Um, I'm a little concerned that now we're putting it in statute and as I look through here, there's a couple of weight limitations and age limitations that I don't think my kids would have fit into or my wife probably wouldn't have been able to be on a car seat till she was 15. So <laughs> again, I'm, I'm showing a little bit of concern that this doesn't say guidelines at the beginning. I, I don't mind it's in statute, but I'm assuming there's a penalty that goes along with this. Uh, can you state the, the penalty that I'm assuming it's something to do with section two? Mr. Hanson. Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, um, you know, all valid points that you're making, um, and there is no one size that fits all. Um, and so what we're trying to do is bring the recommendations from the national experts um, and their recommendations, as you, you referred to, um, into statute so that parents have kind of that one-stop shop so they, they're, they're not facing the same situation you were where, okay, here's the guidelines, here's the statute, how do we make all this, this work together? So by bringing that all together and following those national best practices, we can put it in one place and, and really make sure that parents have the information that they need in order to keep their kids as safe as they can in those vehicles. Yes, certainly there is a penalty if somebody is improperly transporting a child. It's a petty misdemeanor with a $50 fine, and that can be waived if somebody were to go through an appropriate educational process. Um, Mr. Hansen, um, I'll draw your attention to the repealer, section two. Um, on page three, and then if you flip it over and you see that the petty misdemeanor is actually repealed. So mm -hmm. is the intention to restore the petty misdemeanor? Um, as I heard you say, there is a, a petty misdemeanor, but or, or maybe, I'm, maybe it's picked up somewhere else in, in another part of the state law. Thanks. Mr. Hanson. Mr. Chair and members, um, that, is, that is the intent, is to restore the repealer. And these are discussions that we've had internally at DPS today and we will continue to have and we'll work with the authors um, on this to ensure that that repealer stays there. There are a couple reasons for that. Number one, there needs to be some type of you know, motivation or a consequence for not following the recommendations and the statute. Number two, there would be a fiscal impact to the officer traffic safety uh, to the tune of about $65,000 a year. All of that, those fine dollars, that $50 fine goes into a dedicated revenue account and we use that money to buy child passenger safety systems that we distribute free of charge to parents uh, who may not be able to afford them. And so that, there's a couple different reasons uh, for wanting to maintain that repealer. So we are working with the authors um, and with staff to make sure that we clean that language up and so we have a, a better understanding of that with the final version. Senator Carlson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I want to add one more thing, uh, Senator Lang, and that is that you see the, uh, the notation uh, established by the manufacturer. The manufacturer is, uh, is responsible for designing and also uh, submitting the description of the child that can be safely carried in those seats. Uh, it's, uh, and that's the training has been, I, I think, largely uh, showing Grandpa, Grandma, to look on the side of that seat, find out if the seat is is uh, correct for that child facing, uh, and also weight, size, uh, where it's put in, how it's attached. All of those things are part of the instructions on the uh, on the safety seat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess the only thing I would add is I'd rather see some sort of uh, a, a disclaimer at the beginning to say this is our recommendations. Uh, there are probably areas within this statute that we as a state know that we can't address specifically. Um, you know, the, the, and that, that's where I think the system that we had, where the law is very restrictive or maybe not quite so detailed, but the guidelines and the suggestions are the detailed part because they can be changed so specifically. Now we're putting it in statute where you have to come back to a, a room full of us to change it, which maybe isn't always a good thing. Um, that's the, the one concern I have with this is I don't disagree with any of the statements in here. They just are very, very one-sized fits all and I don't think that they fit all very well at all. So, but that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm, I'm just thinking back to my life when I had four kids at home. I still have four kids, <laughs> but I, they're not at home. They're all grown adults now, but... Uh, and, 
and they probably at one time or another uh, could have qualified for a car seat uh, even though they were over 13. But uh, what I'm looking at is I'm thinking back, a lot of the vehicles I had were five passenger vehicles. And I've got a 12 year old and probably three in the back that need, you know, two in car seats and one in a booster seat. And I've got to put that, where do I put the 12 year old? Says he must be in the back seat. I got no room for him in the back seat. In fact, I don't have room for my wife. So usually, yeah, we're not taking everybody in that vehicle. So I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. And as I grandparent now, I've been purchasing car seats to have here instead of where they live because they're in Florida, we're up here in Minnesota. When they come to visit, I need car seats. Well, car seats aren't cheap anymore. They're, you're spending $150, $200 for a good car seat. Uh, I can, I'm just thinking of the people that don't have the dollars and the cash to outlay and now we're gonna find them another petty misdemeanor, 50 bucks that they can't even use to get a car seat. So that's my concern. I, I, I think it's, it's a great idea. Uh, I think restraint systems are super, but holy smokes to put it in, to make these folks break the law just to transfer it to their kids, I think is, is, going to, is a stretch for me. Well, Senator Howard, it is the law presently. I think the the idea is to, to create more clarification. Uh, right now, it's a little hard to follow, and a little this is this is trying to actually address the issues that Senator Lang expresses. And Mr. Chair, is is it right now state law to have you can't put a someone over thirteen under thirteen in the front seat? I know you shouldn't, but I mean I've done it because I can shut my airbag off on that side, but. Uh, Mr. Hansen, you respond. Mr. Chair and Senator Howe, it's been a while since I've looked at the current language, so I would want to go back and review that before I was able to give you a, a true and correct answer for that one. So, all right, well, we'll, we'll get clear on that. Again, we're laying this over, so we have lots of time, all kinds of time to deal with all these questions. Senator Coleman, all right, anyone else? All right, oh, Senator Kuczynski. Well, Mr. Chair, I don't want to date myself or date any of our members, but I think it's been about 15 years since I put anybody in a car seat. And I'm not as old as Senator DeHouse, so I don't have grandkids, but I thought Senator Coleman might have the most practical knowledge of what the system is right now. And again, I, we want to keep our kids safe, but if it's, and I'd like to see the clarification, but again, I've seen Senator Lang's kids and I, they're big, so I don't know if the age and the weight sometimes applies to them, so um, I, we can continue to work on it, but um, uh, I just, you know, it is nice to have some, you know, so you can understand it as easier so there's no gray area. So, and again, I'm, I, I think Senator Coleman should comment on this. Senator Coleman. Well, I, I thank you, Mr. Chair. I do want to comment on it, but I think that there's some misunderstanding amongst our members as far as whether or not this is actually already law and we're just clarifying some things. If you could maybe expand on that a little bit more for our purposes. Mr. Hansen, so um, yeah, one time, one more time with feeling. Um, we, you know, what what is the you know what is the current state of the law with respect to child restraint, and and what is the goal of this bill? As I understand, um, the goal of this bill is to is to create more clarity around uh, what the requirements are, take it out of rules, get it into law, and um, and describe it in a way that that is more understandable. And also, I, I assume there will be a, you know a renewed or continuing effort at public education materials that the public um, can benefit from to, to have some understanding of what their requirements are for transporting children of varying ages and sizes. Mr. Hansen. Mr. Chair, Senator Coleman and members, um, again, let me touch on the education part of it first of all. We have child passenger safety technicians across the state. They're police officers, they're firefighters, they're volunteers. Um, and for anybody who has a question, if, if you've got, you know, kind of one of those tweener kids that you're not quite sure what they should be in, 
please contact our office. We'll put you in touch with somebody who is close by who can meet with you and who can show you and explain to you what is the best type of uh, safety system for your, your, your child at that time. The current language that, that's on, on uh, the books, you know, was written a number of years ago. And as the science and the design of these systems has evolved, um, the guidelines have also evolved from the national experts in child passenger safety. And so what we're just trying to do is modernize that language to bring it in line with those national experts that have that help us to develop, as Senator Lang said, those guidelines that are out there, Safe Kids Worldwide, organizations like that, that help us to put our training classes together, provide the training materials that we use, but also provide us with recommendations for legislation that will improve child passenger safety. You know, motor vehicle crashes are still the leading cause of death for our kids zero to five. And so anything we can do to more safely transport them and protect them is a step in the right direction. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that answer. So I think that I would have to echo then Senator Lang's uh, request that the language sticks to as close as possible, more guidelines. I think our concerns are the last thing we want is to put a mother who's just trying to survive into a tough position. I know from personal experience with my oldest, I have three in car seats right now, uh, from personal experience with my oldest, he had to flip around a few months early because it was so upsetting to him being faced away from us that he would go blue in the face from screaming and I had to make the mother's judgment that's, that's unsafe as well, especially when he starts choking up. And so um, I think that we don't wanna criminalize, demonize any moms that are just trying to figure out and trust their gut and what's the best decision. Uh, so getting the language as close as possible to guidelines versus mandated type language would probably be, be best, thank you. Thank you, Senator Coleman. All right, members, anything further on Senate file number 4488? Um, with that, we will lay Senate file number 4488 over for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. So moving on, Senator Carlson, we have Senate file 4066. Thank you, should have, Chair, excuse members. me, uh, Senator Coleman, I should have mentioned that Senator Morrison is joining us remotely. I wanted to note that for the record. So Senator um, Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And next bill I have is uh, Senate File 4066. And we, this is an agency bill that has several things in it. And uh, so I'll just kind of quickly go through. It uh, talks about using, I'm sorry, this is the one that, yeah, this is one that has, has uh, descriptions of uh, motorcycles. You know, we, we now are adding three-wheel vehicles, neighborhood electric vehicles, to uh, the operational statu statute. It makes some technical changes on motorcycles. Uh, currently, there are two-wheel two vehicle endorsement on driver's licenses and instruction permits, and we're adding the third wheel to them. It strikes a requirement that a peace officer invalidating a driver's license or instruction permit card uh, be accomplished by clipping the upper corner of the card and then also it makes conforming changes to, uh, let's see, to com criminal vehicular operation that results in death to an unborn child or criminal ve vehicular operation that results in great bodily harm or harm to an unborn child to the list of offenses that requires a one year waiting period before a limited driver's license uh, can be issued. And with that I have, uh, I have our, uh, Commissioner here to speak to you and, and expand on how these all came about. Welcome, Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, uh, members, thank you, Senator Carlson. Um, uh, Senator Carlson, I already covered the, the uh, policy uh, provisions thoroughly, and I'll, I'll just add a, little, a few more details. The motorcycle, uh, the definition of motorcycle is already defined in this uh, section of statute, and so instead of naming two-wheeled and three-wheeled, we wanted to just reference motorcycle, which includes both two-wheeled and three-wheeled. Um, 
We are also recommending the, the, to cease the action of actually clipping the credential. Um, uh, FMCSA um, recommends against uh, clipping the credential because the, the CDL actually has information that, that needs to stay on the credential. We have been advising, advising law enforcement um, to stop clipping CDLs already. This will be consistent and we would just stop clipping all credentials at, and um, if there is a re, uh, revocation roadside. Um, the reason being is that our systems are, are real-time updated, so when uh, law enforcement makes that revocation in our system, all other law enforcement get that information, and so the actual clipping becomes unnecessary. It also makes it so the credential can still be used as an identif identity document and uh, just not for driving privileges. Um, and then lastly, uh, the, the, the conforming changes with CVO, um, uh, several years ago, the, the legislature divided the CVO statutes into three sections, homicide, bodily harm, and unborn child. Um, and when we, these conform, those conforming changes did not make the appropriate references to those statutes, and so this is to correct that and, and reference those statutes so that all, all alcohol-related CVOs are treated the same with a one-year um, uh, hold on the, before they can get a limited license. And with that, I'll stand for questions. Um, thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on Senate File 4066? All right. Uh, questions, members? All right. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will uh, lay Senate File number 4066 on the table for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. And then wrapping up the trifecta of Carlson bills, we have Senate File number 3816. The hat trick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate File 3816 is quite a simple bill, but it's probably the one that has to go to more committees. Uh, it is changing the Advisory Council on Traffic Safety membership by adding two additional persons. Uh, this is a, it adds two members to the Advisory Council, which was statutorily established in 2023, and it includes the Director of Minnesota Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board and a person representing victims, a victims advocacy organization. With that, I have uh, Director Hansen again to fill out any details. Director Hansen, welcome. Mr. Chair, members, thank you, Senator Carlson. Um, as Senator Carlson uh, stated, this is very simple and straightforward. When we put together the original roster for the Advisory Council on Traffic Safety, um, these were uh, positions that were inadvertently left off of the roster request when the legislation was drafted. Uh, having the director of EMSRB part of our board um, is absolutely uh, a critical part of that. Um, there is a growing and with good reason emphasis on emergency emergency services and emergency medical treatment that occurs at a crash scene, both at the state level but also at the federal level. One of the, one of the primary drivers for this is per persons who are fatally injured in a motor vehicle crash. Forty percent of them are alive when EMS arrives on scene. The better the pre-hospital care is, the more likely a positive outcome is, the more likely that somebody is going to live rather than die. And so having that director as part of the council is absolutely key to having uh, a, a full, well-rounded uh, roster. And then the same would, could be said for the victim advocacy, somebody from MAD, somebody from Minnesotans for Safe Driving, um, or, or one of the distracted driving groups somebody for, who has that victim's voice that only the victim's voice can bring to the advisory council. Again, the advisory council is now the home of the Toward Zero Deaths program. It provides the structure, it provides the leadership and the guidance for the TZD program. TZD started with four E's. Well, we've expanded that well beyond that in order to take a, a better look at how we prevent crashes from happening in the first place and how we save lives every day. So expanding by two will make the, count, or the advisory council much more well-rounded and much more effective. Thank you, Director Hansen. Questions, members? All right, so with that, uh, Senator Carlson, uh, would recommend that Senate file number 3816 be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. Yep. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you. Senator Coleman. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. 
<laughs> Welcome, Senator Coleman. So we are going to uh, hear your bill, and then I think we're going to hear some discussion on another idea as well that's kind of somewhat related to motorcycle matters. So please proceed with um, your presentation of CNFL 2132. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm very excited uh, to have this bill heard today. I should preface this conversation by saying I have never once ridden a motorcycle in my <laughs> life. Uh, but there are people that I love and that I really care about that are avid motorcycle enthusiasts, including my dad and my older brother. And I think anything we can do to improve visibility and safety for motorcyclists is certainly a worthwhile cause. You know, we see all of those bumper stickers that say start seeing motorcyclists, but we're one of those states that still bans ground lighting uh, for motorcyclists to be more visible in the evening. And so this is a very short, straightforward bill. All it does is permit a motorcycle to be equipped with certain white vehicle ground lights under the vehicle, so long as the light bulbs or strips are not visible to other vehicles and aim to project a steady, non-flashing beam of light not bigger than six feet in radius onto the road area and illuminating an area around the vehicle. And so that's all I've got. I'd be happy to turn it over to my two wonderful testifiers, uh, if you would, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Coleman. Uh, first up, I have Jane Doyle from Abate. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and then proceed with your testimony. All right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairman Dibbles, uh, Senator Coleman, and members of the Transportation Committee. Um, I am Jane Doyle, State Coordinator for Abate in Minnesota. Abate in Minnesota is the largest street motorcycling rights and safety advocacy group in Minnesota with thousands of members who ride a variety of motorcycle brands statewide. Abate in Minnesota has strongly supported motorcycle safety, motorcycle riders training, and legislation to improve motorcycle awareness of motorcycles for decades. SF2132 will permit ground effect lighting on motorcycles as a safety feature to allow motorcycles to be easily seen on the roadway at night. The lighting will not flash or change colors while moving. The lights will be located under the vehicle where the bulbs cannot be seen with reflective radius of no more than six feet on the ground. The proposal will benefit motorcyclists awareness, benefit motorist awareness of motorcycles. Thank you. Questions, members? Uh, Mr. Stahlberger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, my name is Phil Stahlberger. I come uh, here today representing the Motorcycle Rider Academy, which uh, started in 2006 here in St. Paul and is the largest training site dedicated to making riders safer and better riders. They train about 600 riders uh, per year. Uh, we support 2132 and feel that any visibility is better. Uh, having personally been involved in a motorcycle accident this year, and I've been riding since I was 16, um, definitely more visibility is better. Uh, I'm also a member of a motorcycle club here in Minnesota, as well as a national BMW uh, Motorcycle Owners Association. I'm treasurer of that group, and I can say that there are lots of uh, members, and you have heard from one of them, uh, just to make it clear that uh, Mr. Brian Dutcher's letter um, in the committee packet is, uh, he's a member of my association as well. So happy to support Senate file 2132 and we'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Stahlberger. Questions for the witness? All right, would anyone else like to testify on Senate file 2132? All right, seeing none, questions, members, or anything further, Senator Coleman? Uh, Senator Jasinski. Uh, no, no questions, uh, Mr. Chair, but just comment that whatever we can do to make our, our motorcycles more seen on the highway is going to be the better for safety, so I'm all in favor to make sure that uh, it increases the awareness so we see our motorcycles out there. So thank you, Senator Coleman, for bringing the bill forward. All right, I see Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess I'd like to question the, uh, the three testifiers. Is there any restriction on, for instance, colored lights that are in the sides of motorcycles? You know, we've, we see these uh, truck, you know, major trucks uh, having a tremendous uh, display of lights. And uh, I've been riding a motorcycle for many years as well, and, and I know what it's like when someone doesn't see you. So that, uh, I'm just fine with uh, even colored lights. Uh, 
you know, helping light the way and, and helping people see that motorcycle that's coming up next to them. Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Carlson, for the support. The language currently does just say white lights. That is as far as our conversation has gone thus far with law enforcement. Um, but it was brought to my attention from some members of ABATE that there is some desire amongst the motorcycle community to include these types of lights that are amber when driving and turn red when you're braking to help motorcycle or to help other drivers understand when motorcyclists are braking a little bit more clearly. So I have not discussed that with law enforcement yet, but I would be open to amending that down the road if needed. Very good. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Coleman, for bringing this bill. Um, I will join in the chorus of saying whatever we can do to make uh, riding motorcycles more safe um, is what we should be doing. Um, many folks know my son was injured very badly in a motorcycle accident uh, almost a couple of years ago now um, at dusk, and so I think he probably wasn't seen. And so thank you uh, for this. I, my question is, so you mentioned Minnesota is one of the only states who doesn't allow this. Is that... Was there at one time a reason to not allow this, or is it just that uh, it's sort of a newer thing that wasn't addressed previously? Senator Coleman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually don't know the answer to that question, but I'm happy to look into it and get back to you unless somebody... Uh, it sounds like uh, my testifier knows the answer if you'd like to call on her, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Ms. Doyle. Uh, chairman and committee. Underglow lighting appears to be legal in states with the exception of Washington, Minnesota, Illinois, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Maine. Most of the legislation is in regards to motor vehicles. So motorcycles are not specifically listed, but those are the states that currently um, aren't allowing. And we don't know why exactly it has never been allowed in Minnesota. Um, no one thought of it. All right, well, we'll figure it out. All right, Senator Howe. All right, very good. Um, and then, uh, Senator Coleman, were you going to bring up the subject of splitting and um, <laughs> lane splitting and all of that? Oh, Mr. That's Chair, um, uh, thank you. There okay. may or may not be a bill getting drafted at the moment right. uh, regarding lane filtering uh, that I've been working with council on. Um, you know, in the effort to promote motorcycle safety, I think that's a conversation I'd love for us to have down the road uh, as far as reducing accidents, congestion, or, you know, if you wanted to offer an amendment today, I would consider it friendly, so. I heard you, down the road. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, well, we'll have that conversation. I've discussed it with Mr. Stahlberger. Um, we compared, no, I actually used to be a motorcycle rider. It was my only means of transportation, and I got creamed by a car and haven't been on a motorcycle since, so. Um, just kind of put me off the, the whole mode um, for myself. I, you know, I think it's great for other folks, I just, <clears throat> at least for city riding. I'm thinking about getting a touring bike sometime and going out <laughs> on the country. So. <laughs> All right. All right, so with that, we will lay Senate file number 2132 on the table for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. And thank, thank you, you for the Chair. bill, Senator Coleman. I think it's a good bill. Um, and if we finish up uh, before 5, then we won't have to pause for session because I was reminded today that we can't have committee going on while session is occurring. So let that be our motivation. Senate file 3085, Senator Jasinski. Mr. Chair, I am motivated to get you out of here by 5 o'clock, so there's no problem with that. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senate file number 3085, I have an author's A2 amendment that we've been working on with Mr. Greenfield, so I'd offer the A2 at this time. Great. Um, so that's an author's amendment. It's in our packets. All in favor of the A2 say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. And then, Mr. Chair, with that, I also understand Mr. Greenfield has an, a small oral amendment to make it the, in the form that we need, so I'll turn that over to Mr. Greenfield to explain that. Mr. Greenfield. Mr. Chair and Senator Jasinski, um, so the, the, there were some comments suggested by D, uh, DPS to um, integrate this more in line with their MinDrive system. So the uh, first portion of the oral amendment would just be deleting August on lines 1.3, 1.11, and 1.13, and 1.23 uh, to October. So it would shift the effective date from August 1, 2024 to October 1, 2024, corresponding with MinDrive programming. And then on page 1.7, 
at the end of that sentence, there's a reference to uh, a deputy registrar providing um, services that was pulled in from another portion of statute, um, but DPS would indicate that to clarify, we should make a specific statutory reference to the service that's provided by the deputy registrar, so bear with me for the oral amendment. Page one, line seven of the A2, we are deleting this service and inserting the service provided under section 168A11, subdivision one, paragraph E. And that is essentially a service that already exists, but is just looping it in and making sure that the service is specific to uh, the statutory reference. Senator Jasinski makes that motion. Any questions? Just kidding. All just don't in favor ask me to say, repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> what was that again? What paragraph? <laughs> All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll try and get through this as quick as possible. Uh, this actually came from the Salvage Title Task Force a few years ago, if you remember. Uh, it was actually recommended by one of the department uh, employees who's no longer with the organization, but had some recommendations. Uh, what's happening is when, a, say for example, an auto dealer decides he doesn't want a vehicle, he sends it off to the auction, they auction it off, and after the auction, they basically take the plates off before the auction, uh, it goes through the auction, uh, another dealer may buy that vehicle uh, and then it goes to a new lot and they, new, the dealer can actually ask for a, a duplicate title and in that duplicate title or the license it actually goes back to the previous owner's name and we're finding out through parking tickets and just other traffic incidences that it's not very good for that. Uh, so we came up with a bill that would actually clean that up and with that I'm going to turn it over to my testifier to explain it much more in technical uh, terms than I can uh, but that's the issue we're trying to solve here is by having someone's name on a title of a car they don't own anymore. So so with that, I turn it over to Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, welcome. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Todd Hill with Hill Capital Strategies, and I'm here on behalf of my client, Copart. Um, Copart is an auction company that was founded in 1982. Uh, in Minnesota, we have three locations, one in Blaine, Ham Lake, and Avon. And uh, we sell tens of thousands of cars in the state of Minnesota every year. This bill is really helpful for a couple of reasons. Um, the primary reason is so that we can make sure that a customer who has sold a car is no longer liable for that car if it's been sold and hasn't been retitled in another name. And uh, this will also help with some efficiencies with our cl my client, Copart, and uh, drivers and vehicle services. When we uh, sell a vehicle, we remove the license plate and we update the DVS system, making sure that everyone knows that this is a vehicle being held for resale. And as Senator Jasinski said, there's oftentimes though where a dealer may buy that car and then go and get a duplicate title so the plates and the title stay in the name of the individual that sold it. Uh, this will go a long way to correcting that problem. We get three to five calls a day from Minnesotans that are concerned about their car not being, uh, the, having the title transferred appropriately. And we think this will go a long way to, to fixing that system and will be done before five, I promise. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hill. And Senator Jasinski, this is agreeable to the agency? Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe so, but if anyone from DPS wants to come up, and I think Mr. Greenfield's done Mr. more work on this bill than any of us, so <laughs> he may know better than I. Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, members, uh, DVS does not have any concerns with, with this bill, and we appreciate the updated information, and MinDrive makes it better for everyone who uses it. Great. All right. Any further questions? Or would anyone else like to testify in Senate File 3085? Seeing none. Uh, members, any questions, comments, amendments? All right. Anything further, Senator Jasinski? Uh, nothing, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And we are done before 5. All right. So Senate File number 3085, as amended, is laid on the table for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. Members, uh, we have a large roster of bills on Wednesday. People are streaming to my doorstep uh, asking for consideration of late breakers, and so I'm open to that. And if we can't fit you in on Wednesday, I might have a little window um, uh, on Friday, or maybe we can take it in by amendment. We're going to post the omnibus bill sometime Thursday as early as possible, and we'll work with Senator Drasinski's office as well on all of that, and then we'll take it up on Friday for its initial rollout and markup and to pass it out by five o'clock on Friday. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>